Welcome to the second Climate and Energy Forum for this year. My name is Mike Cox. I am the co-chair of Climate Action Bainbridge, and I welcome you here. Um, and uh, so what is the Climate and Energy Forum? Again, I was just saying there's five organizations that, that came together, and we're all doing climate work. And we decided, well, why don't we get together and try to have one area or one focus area on climate and energy and work together to do this. So last year we had a number of these um, and the idea really is to pick a topic, bring hopefully people from the local area here to talk about it, a conversation, and then as it says, you know, increase our knowledge of climate and energy and try to help us understand more what we might be able to do in our lives, helping the community and helping in the political process in terms of moving it forward. Next slide. <clears throat> and as always, we start, and everybody knows this, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but just to remind people, to bring people into the, into the room about what we're talking about. We're talking about climate change and greenhouse effect. I think this isn't a, a new concept by any man, my, any imagination. I think you all know it. Um, so I'm not going to go into it, but just to remind you that the, the infrared come in, greenhouse gases, methane, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, um, absorb some of those and we have warming. Next slide. And so of course the question is, you know, what happens here? And what we see is that um, on this axis there's a global temperature and as you can see on the left side there is temperature and carbon dioxide. Pretty simple relationship, I think you're aware of it. As the carbon dioxide has gone up since the uh, uh, 19th century, the temperature has gone up. Um, next slide. And of course the question is, so what? And so what? Obviously, temperature rises, it has some impacts. Ocean acidification, which we're seeing in this area. Um, we're, seeing, we're seeing that, and that's a consequence of excess carbon dioxide. We have sea level rise. It's happening you know, along our coastlines. And of course, we have a whole array of other issues that climate change touches on, from infrastructure, from flooding in, for drinking water plants, for wastewater plants, all the way to fires, as of course we see in, in California, agriculture, and so on. And just wanted to give some context. In Washington State, right now, about 40% of our, carbon, our greenhouse gases are coming from transportation, about 20% from some called residential, commercial, and industrial. What that means is a combustion uh, for space and process heating in these sectors. Electricity, about 21. That's really lower than the national average. And some of that is because we have a lot of hydro in, in Washington State. But for us here on the island, PSE, it's not quite the same. As you know, we have PSE as our provider. And um, our electricity here is, is not, well, there is some hydro, but a good chunk of it is still fossil fuels. So we'll talk about it a little bit later. And you have the other chunks. So just kind of a picture of where our greenhouse gases come in Washington State. <laughs> Some of you may be aware a couple weeks ago, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out with a new report. It was called uh, Global Warming 1.5 Centigrade Report. And it was kind of startling what they found. Um, what they found is you may remember the Paris Climate Agreement during, this is a couple years ago, they tried to look at if we wanted to keep below two centigrade increase from pre-industrial times, how would we do that? What kind of trajectory in greenhouse gases would we have to do? And so countries made their commitments, but then there was an aspiration, and this was driven by many uh, uh, island countries and, and countries in Africa. They were saying, no, we need to get to 1.5 centigrade, or not go over, excuse me, not go over 1.5 centigrade. And what this report showed was here's our global um, Green, uh, carbon dioxide emissions in 2010, 2017 go up to get to, to ensure that we stay below 1.5 centigrade increase from pre-industrial times, we need to decrease our greenhouse gases here. And by 2050, we actually need to be net zero. What that means is not that we're not emitting greenhouse gases, but either we're capturing them or we have forests that are absorbing them. And so it's a pretty, drastic change that we'd have to do in order to meet that. Now, if you said, how about two degrees centigrade? What would that, what would we need to do? And if you had here that what they projected is by 2070, we would need to have a net zero carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases in order to um, ensure that we stay below two. So kind of dire. But, so then you go, okay, well, that's great, doomsday, 
I might even be dead by 2050, so who cares? Um, but the good thing, next slide, is that things are happening. Things are happening both in the renewable energy side and jobs. And this is just a couple charts that you may um, not be aware of, but in Kansas, Kansas of all places, since 2001, per year, per year, they've almost increased their wind generation for electricity by 50%. Right now, Kansas, almost 40% of their electric, electrical generation is from wind, and they're increasing. Next slide. Texas, another nice blue state down there, um, or maybe tending uh, towards purple, maybe, probably not. But anyway, they're also 29%, um, almost 30% since 2001 per year in wind. They have almost 30% of their electrical generation is wind, and that they want to increase. And finally, just to show Georgia. And Georgia's is starting, but again, quite, a, quite an increase in their use of solar. Next slide. Jobs. You hear a lot about uh, mining jobs, coal mining jobs. Well, right now in the United States, there's about 53,000 coal mining jobs. California alone, in the solar energy industry, 86,000 jobs. So if you look around the country, there's hundreds of thousands of jobs right now in solar energy. And so, and this trend is going to continue. It's not, it's not going to go in reverse. Next slide. Wind energy, Texas alone, 24,000 jobs are related to the wind energy sector. So, um, and there's, you know, there's some blanks here, but right here in this area is uh, an incredible growth in wind energy over time. Next slide. Okay. So what? So what? That, you know, that's great. That's in other states. That's globally. But what can we do here on Bainbridge Island? And this is what this series is trying to ask. Well, what can we do? And we'll talk a little bit about where's this? This is on our island. And Jonathan's going to talk about that today. So these are things we can do. As you see, our, our, uh, our bike, as many of you may know, the safe mobility thing didn't pass. 1631 didn't pass. And we'll talk about that a little later. So let's just dive into the people you, heard, you're, you came to hear, hopefully. Um, we have three. We have um, Els. Where, where are you, Els? Right there, sustainability director for Bay Hay. We have Tony. Uh, he's over there, sustainability director for TNC. We have Jonathan back there. He's with uh, his architect, David Studio, and Mara, Maria Williams, who will also be here. Well, he'd be happy to answer questions. So um, let's get started. And the format's going to be, each one of these per people are going to come up. If you have some clarifying questions in their presentations, please ask those. And then we'll have all three of them come up, and we'll have a general question and answer session. So. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, when I saw the advertisement for the event, I sort of had to double take because it says, how we prevent climate change or change. What did it say exactly? It said um, how local business leaders share how they're working to prevent and prepare for climate change. I thought prevent, I think that's not happening. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. We cannot. All three of us, I don't think, are going to be able to do that. Uh, I brought some pictures so that you can look at the pictures rather than me because <laughs> I'm not... This is not my thing. <laughs> um, I'm sure everybody is familiar with Beihe, but just in case you're not, uh, here's a picture of Beihe and Feed. Um, we at Beihe and Feed really try to do as much as we can to reduce our, our, you know, our, our effect to making the world worse. So, but it's it's sometimes very difficult because you think you're really not making any change. But it really, every little bit makes a big difference. I remember in 2007, we started the bag campaign with um, Sustainable Bainbridge. And we worked with TNC and Safeway and trying to get people to use the bags. And we worked on it for years. and. It just didn't seem like it made a difference. And I would look at the grocery stores and, yeah, there's one person that's bringing their bag. Isn't that great? Now we're in 2018 after we passed the, the 
stop the plastic bag thing on through the city in 2011, now go and look at the grocery stores. Everybody is bringing a bag. So it does work. It just takes sometimes a little bit time. You know what I mean? Um, so next slide. Bay and Feed tries to, next slide, to do as much as it can. We have Bay Hay, we have the post office, next slide, and we have the cafe. So we create, as this building, a huge amount of waste, you think. Next slide. But we only fill one of these every week. Only one. One of them is cardboard and recycling, and the other one is garbage. That's it for the three businesses, the post office, the uh, cafe, and Behe and Feed. How do we do that? Um, next slide. Just forgot. Don't, doesn't it look beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> this is our compost containers. Next slide. So what we do is things like this. We cut down all our cardboard boxes and save them up in the loft. I just took a picture of one little section. And we use them for nursery trays or for when people buy stuff, you know, instead of giving them bags. I mean, of course, we use bags too, but people carry that out and take that home. So we try to give a next purpose to everything. Um, next slide. If we get, like, we get a huge amount of pottery and it's packaged like crazy and there's a million burlap bags. Well, we don't want to use all these burlap bags. We have no use for them. And we don't want to put them in a dumpster. We just put an ad on newspaper or in Facebook, and people come and bring pick up the burlap bags because people love burlap bags. You can use them for all kinds of things. Um, so it's that sort of stuff that we try to do is just reuse, 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 and find another place where we can bring it to or to... Um, you know, empty. We're trying to keep things out of the dumpster as much as possible. Next slide. So we have a, a, a website, of course, and we have a list of all the things that we do. Now we're sort of thinking what kind of things that we do that you can do also that will make a difference. And we, in 2011, I think, we started a rain garden. And um, this is something you can do too in your yard. Look on a rainy day to see where all your water goes. You know, does it go all in the road? Make a rain garden so it filters down, cleans it, catches it, and it goes, you know, we have a water problem on Baymage Island. We can keep it here on the island, that'd be great, rather than running into the sound. So we did the rain garden, and uh, next slide. This is our first rain garden, which catches all the runoff of Bay Hay and Feed. And next slide. And we just created a new, this is a new rain garden. It's not grown up yet, but it, we're just starting it. It takes a little bit. You need to do a lot of filtration and a lot of different layers of the different kinds of soils and rocks and all that sort of stuff, but it works. Next slide. So I was thinking, what is another thing that what we can do. What Bay Hay tries to do is we try to buy as local as possible. I mean, really try. It's not always possible, but we start on Bay Mish, and we go out and we go out and we go out and we go out. And so we try to buy local. Well, that's something you can do too, buy local. Because if you buy online, what do you get? You get a box, you get styrofoam. You know, buy local, then that will help not only the environment, but it would help all the local businesses too because you support the local businesses. And the reason why, next slide. So twice a year, Bay Hay helps with recycling styrofoam. We get this humongous amount of styrofoam every single time. It blows me away how much styrofoam is on Baymatch Island. And that's only from people that make the effort to bring it to us to recycle it. Yeah? So just so you know, the next Styrofoam Recycling Collection event will be um, January, is it 25th and 26th? Is it the last weekend of January? 26th and 
26th, 27th. If you'd like to help SNAP, we can always use volunteer snappers. And I see some in the audience. Okay, thank you. So uh, when we see all this recycling, we're like, where is this coming from? And people say, oh, it comes from a shipment of wine. Oh, I get this because I'm getting this online or I'm getting that online. So rather than, I mean, it's great that we're recycling it, but it would be better to even stop the first step. You know, if you don't buy it, then you don't have it, right? So that's one thing that um, people can do. Um, so, but the reason also why we buy lo b try to buy local as much as possible because it's less freight, less pollution, you know, which helps with climate change and all that sort of stuff. Um, next slide. So we started also a uh, local food um, market at Bahamian Feed, which helps all the local farmers. Um, to bring it to us, and the next step is that people in Rolling Bay can just walk to the store and buy their produce, and which is great because then they don't have to jump in their car. And it's amazing how many people just walk in every day and buy their bread, and it's really fun to see all that. So, um, because as the first slide you saw from the presentation that Kate was before this, was um, transportation is the biggest thing. You know, people in the car. So that's another thing people can do. What Bay Hay and Feed does is we do a lot of deliveries, but every day we save all our deliveries, deliveries till three o'clock, and then we combine them all and then make the run through Bay Mitch, and then we're back. Only the big deliveries go right away. You know, if somebody needs two ton of hay, we can't, you know, pile more stuff on top of the hay bales. But, you know, a lot of some people need two bags of this, another person needs three bales of that, and so we just combine them all. So, but you can do the same thing. If you need to go to town, pile up all your thing. Oh, I need to go to the post office, I need to drop off so-and-so, I have to drop off this kid and pick up that kid from sports. You just combine them all. And then you can just make one trip rather than going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know what I mean? That saves a huge amount of energy. And the biggest one, of course, is have your kids take the school bus. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, sorry, that's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> All these people in the car. Um, see, let's see. Next slide. I think that's it. Oh, and then when we have waste from um, when we have waste from our food market, which doesn't have very happen very often, but it happens, and you know things over the expiration, we first give it to all the employees, for obviously for free. They can have they pick through it what they want to take home and cook from. So most of the time, everything disappears. But if it doesn't, then we have our turkeys, and we have next slide, we have our chickens where all the waste goes to. So if we have a broken bag or something that's beyond repair, that goes to the chickens and the, and the turkeys and stuff like that. So really we try to use everything and make everything disappear. Next slide. And so we have, on our, like I said on the website, we have a long list of all the things we do. And it's not so much bragging rights or something that we have that big list it's sort of good to see that so that you know what you have done and what you have been working on and occasionally we go there and and look at it and say oh yeah that's right oh this we sort of had let slip let's work a little bit more on that and stuff like that so i think it really helps to sort of put it in perspective what you've been working on and um and all oh the other thing is that when you buy something, wh what Behe tries to do, we try to sell quality. Um, because quality lasts. So we try not to sell knickknacks or fruit, you know, just tchotchkes. Or, I mean, of course there are tchotchkes, but, you know, quality tchotchkes. <laughs> 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 because then they last and you can reuse them again and, or, or they just, you know, it, Try to buy quality. La things last, then we don't end up in the landfill. 
I think that's about it, what I have. I'm sure there's a lot of other things, because like I said, when I look at the list, and I'm like, oh yeah, we do that too. But I just, I think this is it for my presentation. And yes, it's on our, um, so we have like 45 items at this point. And um, um, it, it really is something that we just, it's in our soul that we want to make things less. I mean, it just go, goes naturally, and any time we have an issue, and there's still many things that we have an issue with, but it's always hanging out there, like the plastic pots of all the nurseries. You know, We know exactly which nursery takes back what, so we put it in separate piles, so the next time they deliver, it all goes back to that particular nursery, but not all nursery takes back the pots and the trays, but we keep working on it, trying to find stuff. What's that? So I was asking if you were working at Bay Hay when you were behind the Big Bellies downtown Winslow Way, because that's super important, what you did there, and you might want to talk about that a little. <laughs> well, the reason why I didn't talk about it is because, you know, Bay Hay contributed money to one of them. But, um, yeah, when... Uh, Downtown was being remodeled. We needed new garbage cans because it was pretty awful. Um, and it's still not 100% perfect. We keep working on it because it's very difficult for tourists to put the right thing. Or it's actually difficult for everybody because it's so complicated. Do I recycle this cup or do I put it in the compost? Or is it waste or in the plastic? Oh, is this a recycling bottle or is it? So it's very difficult. So unfortunately, a lot of times, the containers that um, have recycling end up having to go into the trash anyway because it's contaminated because somebody puts a diaper in there and then you can't really recycle it anymore. But I think, I think that's just something we have to keep working on it, that one day they will make plastic just in one way so that it all goes in recycling. We just have to keep working on it. Oh, so it goes to Seattle where they um, sort of grind it down uh, and melt it down into these giant blocks and then it gets sold and reused again. So that's what they do with it. It's a huge company that they do all kinds of really bizarre recycling. Yeah, and then resell it all. So, but so that's another important thing is if you recycling isn't a great thing to do, but the next step is that you need to make sure that you also buy recycled uh, buy products that are, have been made of recycled products because if there's no outlet for all that plastic to go and nobody buys it, then there's no market. So you need to make sure you also buy paper that's with has recycled contacts or buy your plastic bags, if you buy plastic bags, that are made with recycled con contacts. So always look at the packages and say, oh, this is made with you know, recycled material, great. Because that way you res support and it gives a purpose for the, the plastic to go somewhere or the paper to go somewhere. So. Right, so she's asking, is Howard bringing the styrofoam to Seattle because he has to go already anyway to do a pickup? Is it, and that's a yes. We don't go to Seattle. We try to. We go to Seattle to pick up stuff. So it's really nice that when you have something to drop off, and then when you bring stuff back. So um, we try to always do the double thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, perfect. So thank you, Al. And obviously, she's very modest. Um, Al started. Sustainable Bainbridge and done a lot of other things. And just on the produce thing, I used to ride my bike to work and back, and I would stop in and get stuff on my way home. So it's, it was a great service. So second person we want to bring up, Tony from TNC, Sustainability Director, and uh, going to talk about some of the work that he's doing. It's um, pretty amazing. He let me go back into the back bowels of uh, TNC, and uh, it really is quite amazing what goes on behind the curtain. And um, so Tony's going to talk a little bit about that. So thanks, Tony. Thank you. I uh, don't have a slide, and they're going to be changing this out a little bit, so sorry if there's a slight distraction uh, while this goes on. 
I am the sustainability director for Town and & Country and Central Markets. And if you aren't aware, we have six stores in, uh, in the greater Seattle area, four stores on the other side of the water and two on this side of the water. And uh, one of our corporate offices is in Paulsbo, which is where I work. I started there about 10 years ago working on sustainability and the things that I do have grown into uh, bigger and bigger projects. So I want to start by telling you how I choose, um, again, this is going to be for the next, um, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, anyway, the way, the way that I go about deciding what to work on uh, on an annual basis is I start to think very top scale, um, like we started out with the greenhouse effect, and categorize subjects that I think are important for sustainability, and I work down from there. So I'll, I'll get, tell you what my top four main categories are. And one is greenhouse gas reduction, so in any way that we can do that. Another one is both resource extraction and then on the flip side of that is disposal, or the worst case would be pollution, which uh, Els talked about a lot. Um, and then biodiversity, uh, to make sure that we're not contributing to any species decline or any other type of biodiversity loss. And then the fourth is community outreach, or, or the social aspect of sustainability. If you think of sustainability as the triple bottom line of environment and social and financial, uh, that's the fourth category. So I'm going to touch a little bit on how these actually come out into projects that we work on. When um, the Paris Accord was signed in, I think it was December of 2015, uh, the U.S. agreed that they would reduce their greenhouse gas gases by about 25 to 28 percent by the year 2025. And so right after that, I went up to the owners and I said, um, can we do better? Will, will you allow me to pursue doing better than that goal uh, without setting a goal for myself? Just see what can be done. And to their credit, they've spent over $1.2 million in the past two years on energy savings uh, for all of the stores. The for example, I've changed all of the lights in all of the stores except for Paul's Bow, it's just because that's the last one on the list, n not any other reason, um, to LED lights. Um, most recently, Ballard and Shoreline were just changed over to LED lights. And LEDs from the lights that we were using, which was a mix, uh, is probably about 20% of the energy that the others were using. Some of them were very inefficient lights. Um, other energy efficiencies, uh, we took a look at all of our HVAC, which is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, and figured out if we could do anything to make those more efficient by putting on computer controls or changing out uh, processes that are on there. And we've addressed every single one of those HVAC systems in all of the stores. And along the way, we also got rid of the worst of the refrigerant gases that were left over from the old days, um, which it turns out is a little difficult to do. Uh, but we were able to find a refrigerant gas that works in the old systems, but we get rid of the old really bad ozone depleting gas that was in there. Um, other things that we do under the greenhouse gas category, greenhouse gas reduction category, uh, is just general facilities maintenance. Um, you know, as, the, as the seasons change, summer to winter, and cold or warm outside, it affects the inside of the building. So we have some stratifiers, air stratifiers, that will either pull heat out of the ceiling and warm the floor if it's cold, or do the opposite when it's warm outside. Uh, we've also got things like photoelectric detectors on some of the lights, even some of the shades on some of the buildings. Um, and then the, uh, the last thing that, it's not the last thing we do, but I just wrote down four. Uh, the last thing we do around greenhouse gas reduction is provide electric vehicle chargers 
for customers. And I'm always playing around with which is the best brand of vehicle charger and how do you entice more customers to charge their vehicles at the store by playing with things like the pricing on it. If you have an electric vehicle um, and you charge outside of home, you'll see the rates go, I don't know, anywhere between free and 49 cents a kilowatt hour probably. That's, that's the high end. At home, you'd pay about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so anyway, we have the electric vehicle chargers wherever it's physically possible to put them. And uh, so there are a couple markets where we don't have them. So that second um, category, resource extraction and pollution, um, as Els was saying, you know, the best thing you can do is not bring the stuff in in the first place. And then you want to reduce your use or reuse and then if you do have waste at the end, take care of it properly by recycling it or giving it away is something. Uh, and I start with the office. You know, when I came in, I remember we used to buy 100% virgin paper, office paper, and people used to print emails all the time, and all the settings on the printers were one side only. So I calculated how much paper we use in a year, and just, you know, reams stacked up on the floor flat not end on end, but flat, if you made one stack, it was as high as the West in Seattle. And once I showed people that, they started to realize that this is an enormous waste and probably a waste of money too. Um, and things like that got us to change to presetting all the printers to double-sided printing, presetting everybody's computer to double-sided printing, changing the font so it doesn't use as much ink when you print, um, defaulting to black and white, and so on and so on, and buying 100% recycled paper. And of course, uh, you know, there were some complaints along the way. You always get those, but uh, you work through them and eventually people will come on board and realize this is not an issue at all. <laughs> I used to get things like, I can see the print on the other side of the paper. <laughs> and I would say, it's an email. <laughs> you shouldn't print it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so I start out with the office supplies, uh, and that includes recycling printer cartridges, you know, choosing to buy the printers where you can buy a cartridge that gets recycled and refilled as opposed to just chucking the thing in the first place. Um, and then uh, when it gets down to, oh, the other packaging, of course, is all the food packaging, and that is an ever-changing battle. So we're driven by what the locality can recycle and compost. And we try and buy packaging that can be recycled or composted in that specific locality. And for us, we have six stores. So it's, it's not just the rules on Bainbridge or the rules on Paulsbo, but it's all the stores. And all of those municipalities have different rules. You know, Bainbridge has a plastic bag ban, Paulsbo does not. Seattle doesn't allow any non-compostable um, foodware. Um, Shoreline does allow it, but they don't allow plastic bands, and, and you can go on and on. And of course, the newest one on Bainbridge is that, uh, although they haven't made a big announcement about it, is only plastics one and two are really going to be accepted for recycling. So here we had purchased all this packaging, put a lot of tests into, you know, will, will the package hold up? Does it close right? Does it leak, et cetera? Um, and we finally got all the packaging in, and now we're going to have to relook at what packaging can we get that's just a number one or two plastic, because that's what Bainbridge recycles. Um, and that, that'll probably take six months for us to get through that. Uh, I was just over at the store yesterday changing those shadow boxes out where it shows you what goes where, and I updated it to the newest rules. Um, and then the waste side of that is, um, I call it pollution. <laughs> if, if it doesn't get recycled, doesn't get composted, it goes in a landfill, I call it pollution. Um, and we're trying to avoid that any way that we can. Uh, the biggest one is we take back plastic bags, and please tell everybody you know to bring in their plastic bags. And we probably take more than you might think. It's not just the soft plastic bag um, from uh, the outer wrap of bread or 
from the plastic bag that you get at the cash register or anything like that. Uh, I tell our stores, as an example, the food service gloves that they have can go into the plastic, re plastic bag recycling. We recycle uh, the, the, the usual recyclables, cardboard, wood, paper, plastic, metal, glass, uh, but we also have special outlets like the styrofoam recycling. We take our styrofoam that we get, uh, although we've reduced it to almost maybe two suppliers are, only, are the only ones giving us styrofoam. Um, we take that to the same place in downtown or South Seattle to recycle the styrofoam. Uh, we recycle the oil from the, from the fryers to biodiesel. Um, for that matter, we recycle the oil that comes out of grease traps um, into biodiesel uh, with the same company. It, yeah, they come and they pump it out themselves. They come with a truck and they pump it out. Yeah, and so when they clean the grease trap, they separate out that greasy gunk, and that gets uh, turned into biodiesel along with all the good fryer oil. Um, okay, and then... Um, we have semi-hazardous wastes that we take care of too, light bulbs and batteries and chemicals. Um, but uh, the third category is biodiversity. And um, biodiversity, we have a pretty impressive sustainable seafood program, which is listed online. Uh, basically, we don't buy any seafood that is overfished or that harms other sea life, like dolphins or turtles. Um, we do the same thing with some other ingredients like palm oil that gets used in our tortilla recipe. It comes from sustainable palm oil plantations because of the association with ruining orangutan habitat. Um, and then the social part is um, a couple of things. All our employees go through a three hour sustainability training and uh, we are working on providing mass transit different types of mass transit options for employees. Uh, we also donate to food banks. We donate quite a large amount of food to food banks, um, and all, the, all the local food banks. So here on Bainbridge, it's the local one on Bainbridge and so on. Um, and we do other donations for businesses that are kind of in our field. So food and ag industries, um, and hunger industries, that kind of thing. We do financial donations for those. Uh, the, the last thing I wanted to say about this general overview is customer requests can force changes, whether it's customer requests for us to change a piece of packaging out or it's customer request for one we got recently was, can you start selling uh, bacon that's cured without sugar? Um, for the uh, ketone diet or something like that. I can't remember the name of the diet. Um, so we start bringing it in, and lo and behold, it sells a lot. Um, so I would encourage you to make customer requests. You can do it through the web or directly talk to people at the stores because sometimes that's the way to prove that this change is wanted. So anyway, with that, um, we'll come back to questions, uh, right? Thanks. Yeah, there'll be an opportunity for questions after uh, Jonathan does his and bring that up. And um, so thank you, Tony. Uh, quite amazing what they're doing. You're, and Tony, don't you have solar panels um, while, while they're getting this going? Uh, yesterday, I was at a conference, a workshop down in Portland on land trust, climate change and land trust. And it was fascinating. Bainbridge Island Land Trust was there and how many of these land trusts are just starting to incorporate climate change into the work they're doing. And um, the three people from Bainbridge Island Land Trust were there and they are going to start developing uh, a climate plan to help them figure out how they're going to move, move forward in their purchasing. And so maybe an opportunity if any land trust people here to um, provide some input to them and maybe push them a little bit. Um, and what was fascinating was this was people from Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and the most challenging land trusts are those that have land in the west and have land in the east of Washington or Oregon, and the different opinions and how they have to try to balance those. But one of the other things I found fascinating, and I didn't know this, down in Nisqually, they have gone into the carbon market, and so they are actually um, 
the, they had to pay about $100,000 to do this verification, but they are going to make almost $500,000 in selling the carbon, so to speak, the carbon credits to California and the European markets. And so um, it's quite, quite remarkable in terms of what you can do with this uh, stock of, um, of land. And again, I don't know if we have a big enough land mass here on Bainbridge Island to, um, to make that work, but something to keep in mind, especially the land trust people when you're poking Jane, tell her, come on, we gotta get moving here. Anyway, there we go. It's working. So Jonathan, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm Jonathan Davis uh, and an architect in town and I work very closely with Maria Williams who is a um, sort of a developer, visionary, wanting to, and both of us sort of want to figure out how to make some changes that have some significant impact in the footprint that we all make. And a lot of the work is through creating communities um, and then some, and and because by living together in community, whether it's on an island like this or in a grouping of houses, we have connections to each other and that helps uh, create resiliency. So um, I wanna first talk briefly ab about a few strategies we used at Grow Community, which is, is a project that now I'm realizing is we started working on it seven years ago and, and um, completed for phase one about five or six years ago. Uh, and so a lot of you will have heard some of, or heard a lot about this already. So I'm gonna, I, I really just wanna talk about in, in this, well, first let's move to the next slide. We looked, we used a strategy a, 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 a developed by one plant, by a regional in the UK, and it was One Planet Living. And the concept is we have one planet. We live with a five planet footprint in the US. We need to do something about it. You know, we need to bring our footprint down. In Europe, they've got about a three and a half planet footprint. But it's the, what we liked about one planet was that it it doesn't just look at energy. It just doesn't look at you know, food. It looks at a whole array of different strategies that you can do to create, to reduce the footprint that we all live in, and to create connections and to create a balance. And what I, their list, one the last thing at the at the bottom of the list was always this health and happiness piece, which we went, well, how do you, what's that about? And then we realized that that's, a, that's what it's about, that all this stuff we're doing is for our health and which then gives us happiness, which makes for a, a, a much more complete and fulfilled life. So, um, and I'm gonna, I wanna look at a couple of pieces, first solar, but then what I think Mike brought up earlier that transportation has a huge impact and I wanted, we've, we had some, we looked at transportation at Grow and didn't, it wasn't, we weren't terribly su successful at that time because of various reasons, but we're, uh, we're doing a project now where we think we've got at least a much better solution to it. So I'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, let's look at solar um, because it's something that works really well. It's, and, it's, and everyone, or most everyone can do it. Um, if you've got a roof that faces the sky, you can, you can generate energy. Um, and, but what, th it is, it works, it's, and we wanted to make it really, really simple for people moving into grow and, to m and moving into, and we wanna do this for future, pro and we're doing it for future projects, is how do you make it so people just say, yes, I want that? And, and all the complications of how am I gonna pay for it, who's gonna install it or taken care of. So we, wor we created a partnership with the, the development team put together with a, a credit union that was going to provide the money uh, with, and it was very easy money, that they would basically, if you had the credit to buy a house, they'd give you a credit to, to borrow on the solar, and they would, um, and because of the rebates that we get, the, in the production incentive rebates we get here in Washington, they basically uh, take that from you as payment each year. So, so it was like, okay, it's easy to do. So let's just, um, people, w which encourage people to sign up. Then ANR Solar, who's a big Seattle solar installer, they said, we will provide you good pricing and we'll, we'll do all the installs. So 
we had someone lined up to do that, and then Blue, Blue Frog Solo, which is a local company that provides inverters, and and um, they they prov they provided their services, and so we put a package together that made it really easy. And what we we have 23, 20, excuse me, 22 individually owned homes at Grow in phase one. We thought yeah, maybe 50%, maybe 75% if we're lucky would sign up for this. But 100% of the roofs are solar at Grow. So let's go to the next slide. And, um, and, so, and solar is really working for us there. And, and let's go to the next slide. We did, these are some early studies we did of eight houses. And how well solar works is dependent on how you live in it. Because all the houses at Grow were designed to be net zero. We used various energy strategies to, we, we, had, we sort of figured out our energy budget, what we can produce on the roof, and then how do we design a house that only uses that amount of energy each year. And so if we can produce that much each year and use that much each year, then we're at net zero. Well, we, had, we have four houses in this study that were net positive, which means they were producing more energy than they needed, um, which is, I mean, all of this energy is making an impact for, for the state because it's so solar and we're not having to rely on coal and so forth. And, and, but then some of the houses, were not even anywhere close to net zero. And, it, and we looked at how people were living in those houses and they were living, one of them, this one with the big gray column, was a, that was a renter who were like, well, it's, I'm not invested in this. It's, and so they just kind of lived there and kept the heat on and had big screen TVs and whatever it was they did, but it just was out of whack. And then another one, they had some dogs and they kept the, ha and the the house had to be warm for the dogs, so so that you know that it was it's how you live, and 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 then so it's so and then some of them we had the net positives we had two people living in a house designed for four people, so that's that's kind of easy to kind of meet that budget. So it the lifestyle has an impact on how you we can design for net zero, but oh I'm okay. Um, it, it does count how, how you live in these. And, and so let's go to the next slide. Um, that's just an overview. And, and I've been talking about phase one. Phase two has some solar on it. You don't actually see it. And, um, and so people go, well, why didn't they do solar on phase two? Well, they did on a lot of it. Um, and, and, uh, but you just don't see it. So we'd, I think when we go to the next slide, yeah, so we're doing another project here that's under construction right now. Maria's um, running this project. That it's it's just at the north end of the trailer park on Madrona Way. Uh, it's under construction right now. There's there's six buildings there. We designed four of them, um, but the, this is also this is a it's individual townhouses, but it's really sort of multifamily living. But every one of those townhouses is again designed to be net zero. And and um, so we have solar on the roofs, but on a on a three-story building, solar on the roof is not that visible. So we used solar also on the walls. So and now this these panels are not nearly as efficient as what you have on the roof. From the but they do produce, and I'll I'm going to talk a bit more about those in a minute. We also use them on the south-facing windows as shade canopies. So these keep the sun out of the windows in the summertime, but they're also generating power through all year. So, so and, and they're, they're billboards, they're visible, they're, they're part of the look of the project. So um, we're, we're under construction now, we're there, everything's designed to be net zero. We're, we will re it'll take a year or so before we um, know whether they're living net zero. Um, but what's this, from a business point of view, it makes a lot of sense to provide solar on a project, whether it's a for sale project or a rental project, because it, even though you necessarily can't charge any more, it does, it, it, it helps it mitigate the risk of a project, because it's something, if someone says, hey, I can live in a solar project, I'm gonna live there versus living in just a standard place without solar for a lot of people in this market anyway. So there's, so there's a, there's, plus as some of these are rentals, the solar actually 
and the energy is being provided by the, the property owner, or the electricity is provided as part of the lease, it helps bring the cost down of running these for the property owner. So there's a business sense that, that w Mari has worked out all the spreadsheets that if you, as a business owner, there's a, it, there's a, a, a business financial case to be made for putting solar on that will actually make you money in, you know, over the course of the, of the project. So, um, and she can speak more directly to that. Um, but the other piece that we're doing at this project, and, and this is what these wall panels are actually going to be used for, is we're providing, w one, we're, we're going to have, we have the ability to put electric car charging at every parking space. We're not necessarily installing it right now, and this is one thing that, that we learned at Grow. We didn't run conduits to every parking space. We have conduits run to some, and, and, and we don't actually have any electric cars at Grow because charging them is a bit of an issue when you've got this sort of parking lot situation. So it's one thing we're working on. But at the walk, we're, we're providing, there will be initially some charging stations and they're all just gonna be a plug. They're not gonna be a system, you just can plug your car into it. And, and, and we, the piece that we couldn't solve at Grove because there wasn't anyone out there providing the service and if we as an HOA owned the car for a car share, we would have liability for it, and that was just something that wasn't, th the, the HOA couldn't tolerate from a liability point of view. But there's a company that will provide you now electric cars, a, a bit like Zipcar and you know, all the different go, car to go and so forth, but they'll park these cars at the pro project, and it will, they'll be for the residents, and the resident pays a fee, but they will maintain the car, and they will, and, and, and then the, project provides the power to charge it. So now we can, we can offer the ability for people to live their car free and ha really redu help reduce the, the transportation piece that is so big. Um, and, the, and those wall, pa the panels that are on the end walls, the energy from those will go directly into the car charging. So you can, so there's like, I'm, there's the energy coming into my car. It's, it's being generated right there. At Grow, we have one car per, fa per household there. Because of those long trips, the camping trips where you need to have a bigger car, I have a gas-powered station wagon. I'd love to not have that and drive a Leaf or something or a Tesla around town, and have, but I can't necessarily take one of those smaller cars camping with me. S but, and some people do that by having one gas car and one electric car. We can't do that at Grow, so, it's, so we're, we're we are looking at, we, once we've kind of got it going at the walk, we, we want to then bring this concept to grow and say, hey, I, are we interested as an HOA? Because I, and Mari and I both live at Grow. Um, are we interested as an HOA to have this ability to get, get, either get rid of your car or have, you know, the opportunity to drive in a different way? So, and, and the other piece that um, f you, we hear about in the, in, in all the, a lot of the discussion is that in the way we drive cars is changing. The way we own cars is changing. That, that it, there are some projections that, at least in some places, that in five years we won't own cars. We will have, have self-driving fleets of cars that will drive around, and we won't have to own a car, and we won't have to park a car. And so there's, I mean, that has an implication in in how we actually plan for the future and what we do. So, so. Th I guess from, from the point of view, so that's kind of how some of the things we're doing locally on some, some of the projects, just from us as an architect and the work we're doing. I mean, w because of the work we did at Grow, we, we are focusing much more on, on community development um, and with the idea of resiliency and having a shared purpose. It's not just, I mean, the idea of just creating a subdivision like we used to is something that I think is, is done. We need to think differently about it. And so because of the work we've done at Grow, we're able to, it's leading us to other projects. Um, oh, can you do the next one, please? This is, this is a project, to, you know, the, the Georgia slide that you showed. This is Florida. And, you know, the developers saw what we were doing at Grow and wanted to do a 200-unit project in Florida. And Mari and I worked on this together. It's, it, in the end, it didn't work for other reasons, but... Mario put together a business plan for even in, Sol in Florida where there are no incentives, you could put solar on this building and make a business case for ha providing solar that the investors you know, went, okay, that makes sense, we can, we can do this. So 
And, and again, we use you know, a lot of the same ideas of, of clustered housing and remote parking for cars and so forth. We apply those principles to this. Let's go to the next slide. This is, this is the work that we did. It's, this is the, uh, our concept for Suzuki originally, where we, again, we, we want to create community. We want to find ways to r reduce impact. This project, we're just getting started again. Uh, or, well, we've done, we've done all the research for the site work and we're gonna be at council this week and there's a public meeting in, in on the 28th where we'll be looking at the, the work that started or the, the work we've done to investigate the site and then be talking about how we're gonna move this project forward. Um, there is a component of affordable housing in these projects. The walk has 10% uh, permanently deeded affordable housing that will also have the solar and the access to the electric cars. So we're really working to, uh, from an equity perspective to make sure that these, these designs and these opportunities are available to people of all economic levels. This project will um, likely end up being 100% yeah, affordable it's the housing. the city is requiring right. that, so. Um, so. So as we're solving problems, um, we're keeping equity in mind and affordability. Yeah, which goes back to the, the one planet. Equity was one piece of the 10 principles that we use. So it's, n it, you know, it's this, every all of this stuff, this around, I mean, it's, there's, there is climate change, but there's so many other issues that we need to be, re re we need to build resiliency into all of these. And this is another project we're doing out in Schlang County in Manson. Again, using using a commu you know, the, the concept of community development and how, d and, and providing housing that is not, deeded affordable, but um, market rate affordable. Th here's the challenge. How do we take our five planet footprint and make it a one planet footprint? Um, and that's what every, uh, this is all about. And we each do our little bit. So thank you. So could I have there, um, Tony, Mara, Hells kind of come up here. And so now we're just going to have um, questions for um, for the folks, open it up, and if you have a question, Herb will run around and, and give you the, the mic. So open up, questions? So you're running businesses, so you have to make a business case for these decisions, and you were saying like how you spent $1.2 million on, they agreed to spend it, and so um, how do you, and well, you're creating energy for the market, so you're making money there. You said you're making a business case, so I just wondered like in general, like how do you um, make the business case for these changes? Well, I think you first have to have it in your gut that you want to do it. And you cannot always make a business case out of it. I mean, sometimes you just have to do it because you believe in it, you know. And, but, and sometimes the rewards of that it works out comes later. Uh, yeah, you, you can't always make the business case. And what I try and do is I pursue the ones where I can make the business case so that the ones where I know it's not possible I can say, you know, we did so well with this other project <laughs> um, that we have a little bit of slack that we could put towards this one where it's just going to cost us money. Um, and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't work. I've, you know, I've been turned down <laughs> a number of times. Um, but uh, let's say the, um, the, the used to be styrofoam trays for meat and seafood. Uh, Seattle mandated that we get rid of those. And I said, well, let's just get rid of them at all the stores, but it cost money. Uh, however, the owners were invested enough that, I mean, in, in the idea of getting rid of styrofoam, that they said, okay, let's do that. Um, uh, business case one, I'll, I'll give you the most amazing one. Um, we did uh, all, of, all the lighting at Shoreline store. Now that means every light and every closet and bathroom and office, everything, um, changed it to LED. Uh, we didn't have to do every light, but if we did every light, we got an extra 30% on the rebate. It cost us about $240,000 to do all, that all the lights in that store, and we got a rebate of $157,000. And we're saving enough money that in 1.2 years, we've made it back. So those are the... the yeah, <laughs> ones where you, you get a little uh, bonus credit for the ones where you're not going to make any money off of. <laughs> the, 
Yeah, I agree because it, we change all the lights in Beihei too. It comes back. It costs a lot of money, but it comes back in a couple of years. Same thing with the solar panels. The whole old building is covered with solar panels on the top. You don't see it, but you know that comes all back. And the same thing with uh, all uh, the we changed all the heaters are now energy efficient too. It just comes back. It is ex the first bite is expensive, and you're like, Ugh, but it comes back. In the projects that we do, our goal is to make sure that uh, the financial strategies as well as the designs are replicable. We feel we can have a much broader impact than just the work we're doing here on Bainbridge Island if we can create replicable strategies. And in order to do that, they have to be financially profitable. And so um, everything that we're trying to do is making a business case um, for the energy efficiency, the health impacts, all the different things that we incorporate in our designs of neighborhoods and houses. And we've been able to do that with the solar. The solar is really easy, as Elle said, that um, there's an incredible return on that and a really quick payback time. So that's easy. Um, we're working, as Jonathan said, on transportation and making the business case for that, and also on healthy building materials, incorporating sustainable business, uh, sustainable and healthy materials in our buildings, and looking at how that impacts people's lives. So, everything that we do, we provide case studies, financial case studies, so other developers, other designers can look at what we did and share that with the rest of the world. Yeah, and I think what we've been fortunate with and, and, and is that you get developers who see this and they say, I get it. And I th and the other thing, and people who get it, they're not necessarily just, I mean, they get it because it's in their gut, like you said, and people, and, and at Grow, we had developers or investors who were challenging us. People come to us and, and when, when they have that kind of sensibility, then the, that yes, they're business people and they want to make some money, but they're they're not necessarily looking to make the most amount of money. They want to have some sort of impact with their investment, and that has a you know social consequences and so forth. So there's it's a it's rebalancing kind of the business case that that okay, I don't have to make a 50% return. I'm happy with a 20% return. I mean, just to I don't know. The numbers are not quite that, but it's just that kind of thinking. So I think there's a shift. I mean, we there's all sorts of shifts that are happening here, and mm -hmm. just the investment side of it is shifting too because people want an impact. I would add to that the, uh, the project, the walk that Jonathan mentioned that is under construction. We won't know until it's finished and people move in, but the way that we are projecting that project has both social and environmental impacts, positive impacts. So we look at it as an impact investment opportunity that project will probably have profit returns similar to any other real estate project that you might invest in right now. So our goal there is to share that financial case study and show that there is a case for including social and environmental, uh, I don't like the word impact, it sounds so negative, but components of that project and that projects that do that do not have to provide a lesser return. In fact, they have much less risk than other projects. As Jonathan mentioned, people are really interested in living in projects like that rather than a standard house or um, living in homes that have healthy, healthy building materials that don't impact their health. So um, that's kind of the case that we're trying to make because we feel we can reach a broader population, get more investment in projects that really matter. I was just going to add one more style of um, business case is risk avoidance. <clears throat> so the way I was able to get rid of the worst of the refrigerant gas was to point out that we're going to have to get rid of it anyway because of the Montreal Protocol. I won't go into all the details on it. It's a, it's a time step system where you have to get rid of these gases over time. Um, and the longer we wait, the more expensive it becomes to get rid of them. Uh, so there's an advantage to do it quickly. So it's just another style of making the business case. I live in Anchorage. How do I import some of your expertise? <laughs> the work, as I showed you, this Florida project, and we're, we're actually looking at some, getting involved in some work in the UK, and, and we've done work in Vermont and Virginia and so forth. So I think, I mean, from our point of view, we are we can work in any sort of situation and when whenever we take on a new project we figure out we look at the challenges and then figure out how to 
answer them from for that environment. I mean, Florida is very different than here when it comes to what the heating and cooling load is. Anchorage is at the opposite end of that spectrum. So, so we, from our point of view, we would we would take that expertise that we are developing and and you apply it wherever we are situating a project. So, and then I think y there. Are what Sustainable Bainbridge and all these other groups that are involved with are doing is bringing awareness to people and, and there are, there's information out there that if, you, if you're in Anchorage and want to start this conversation, and I imagine there are some people already up there having that conversation, you just got to get people together and start it going and uh, it's, you know, over the seven years that I've lived on Bainbridge, things have changed a lot in how people perceive this and what the you know, reality is. Uh, Jonathan, you mentioned at the walk uh, project that you guys are doing that the panels you've got on the side of the building are charging uh, electric cars. Do you have, is that just going into the grid and then you're charging them from the grid or do you have on-site storage? And another question about uh, grow phase two, you mentioned there weren't as many folks doing solar there. Is that because of the, the residents' requests? Um. At the walk, we, we're not getting into any storage. So the grid is great storage. So we will have a net meter and we'll, the, the, I mean, and when, when you have anything that's hooked up to the system that's where we have solar being generated, the first use for the, you know, as it's being produced, if you're charging a car, it's going directly to the car. But then as it's producing and you're not using, you know, the lights aren't on or the car charger is not being used, then it's going into the grid and you just pull it back out of the grid when you need it. Um, Storage is something that is evolving rapidly, um, and, and it's just, for a project that size, is, it would just be, at this point in time, be too expensive. We're, we're doing some on a residence we're doing where, where it's just starting to make sense, but it's a budget that doesn't really, ha I mean, we've got the, the ability to do it, to put some Tesla battery walls in. Yeah, yeah, but they're, they're very expensive, and, and, and they're, I mean, they're, they're hard to get hold of, and so it's, it's happening. It's just, it's this. I think in, if we s in five years we'll have a very different sort of situation, and uh, the way things are evolving. So, um, and then the walk. No, excuse me. Phase two at grow. It's that's a little tricky for me to answer because I'm not wasn't in. Yeah, Mario will have a, a, maybe a bit more information. Yeah, so multifamily buildings, that um, a lot of those buildings are uh, three, three apartments stacked on top of each other, and so they share a roof, and so it's a little bit more difficult. The, um, part of it is that the incentive program for solar incentives in Washington State was really geared towards single-family housing only when they put it into place, um, and so those incentives were only available for single-family homes. And it made a big difference. When we started this project, solar cost $9 a watt, when we put it on, I think my house, it was about five, 550 a watt. It's now 250 to 275 a watt. And as, so those incentives really helped people who wanted to implement with solar while it was still very, very expensive. And now that that price is coming down, it's becoming easier. So you're seeing it more and more on multifamily buildings and rental buildings. I think the walk that we're doing will be one of the first apartment rentals in the Seattle area that will make solar available to renters. Um, so that's partially why you don't see it on as many of the buildings um, in the phases two and three at GROW. It's just a really, really complicated financial structure to get it up there and um, to access the incentives. So it's, it's there on quite a few. I think it was on, when we saw in the aerial, it's on three of the large buildings, yeah. and not the fourth. So um, it's, it's a work in progress. Um, a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, I've participated in s several international plastic-free months, and the only reason uh, I'm able to do it is because of TNC. So I would like to put in a huge plug um, for their, their bulk foods. They're cheaper most of the time than packaged foods. Bring your own jars. They weigh them there, whatever. I keep some in my car. Um, but if you're sick of plastic, y you can do so much because of TNC being in our, our community. It's, it's really fantastic. 
The second thing is if you look at those towns and cities and communities that have really cut their waste, um, they've done it because it's mandatory. And I think we saw that very clearly with the bag ban. And I know there are people on council right now that would really like to do some very innovative things in terms of reducing all the waste that, that you know, we're, we're producing on this island. And it's gonna be tough because when any of these things come up, we've got a lot of very loud voices in the community who just don't like this kind of thing. And they're not a lot of them, but they've been very effective. So I, I think it's important for all of us here that if we see council really stepping up, that we get vocal about you know really, really supporting it um, because otherwise it's not gonna go through. So uh, you know, maybe some of you would comment on some of these mandatory rules, but when you mm -hmm. look at Seattle right across the water that makes composting mandatory, people have learned to live with it. Um, and, and you know, absolutely banning certain kinds of takeout things that, you know, once a takeout container is contaminated, it can't be recycled. It's, it's a joke to think that, you know, this is recyclable. It's never gonna be recycled. So anyway, you know, I know you're, you're very active in this kind of thinking, um, you know, so can you make some reactions to some of this? We actually went to a lot of effort to get exemptions from the four different health departments that we deal with in the six stores that allows you to bring in your own package, um, glass or plastic or a, a bag, uh, and refill that with uh, dried product from the bulk department or honey or oil from the bulk department. You can't do that in uh, something like deli with fresh meats because of the hazard associated, but with uh, dried foods, honey, and oil, uh, you can. Um, and uh, coincidentally, Kitsap was the roughest to, to convince. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was <clears throat> Kitsap County is considering a plastic bag ban similar to the one on Bainbridge Island, and there's a little hesitancy there. Um, it would be great if they heard from some of their constituents I think the holdout city is Paulsville right now, but uh, uh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> so that would be uh, uh, something you could do that would help along the way. And I'm sorry, I forgot the third point. Oh, I was just talking about the fact that if, if we're going to really advance in waste reduction and we can get the council to lead on oh. this, we're all gonna have to speak up. You know, I know the bag ban, when it was voted on, it was unanimous. Mm -hmm. And we really worked ourselves silly to, to get that done. And part of the help was TNC speaking up about it. You specifically coming out and saying, yes, we need it. Um, so I, I think any of these things, if we could get some food people, some restaurants, and whatever else to really support some of these things as they're proposed, it would be very helpful. Yeah, I agree, thanks Thanks for that, yeah. Um, they're, they're looking at a packaging initiative on Bainbridge, which I, I support the last version that I saw. So, I, Dan, do you wanna m mention anything about that? Or? Okay. <laughs> I think the the key to any of these, I mean, we do have a, a receptive council for this sort of stuff. I think, again, it's we can't rely on them to put it together. I think we have to come to them. And I know the mayor has said, if you, if you want something, then bring it to us in a state that we can kind of deal with. They don't want to have to be crafting it. So, so we have to uh, we put this together in, in a way that you know, makes sense, and then they can, they can deal with it. So. Uh, I just encourage everyone to, to figure out how they can get involved to, to really be constructive in this. Uh, yeah, I'm going to comment on another good deed uh, from our local grocer, T&C, and this may not be directly in Tony's sphere, but uh, Middlefield Farm is a wonderful 
augmentation and the expansion at Bay Hay of the locally produced and grown. Um, and so to the extent you design communities and you have room for pea patches and other, uh, I didn't grow originally have that uh, or some piece of it like that. Yeah, we have, there's a grow throughout, there are pea patches, there are raised beds. Yeah, so, and, and it's, and I mean, not just in the raised boxes, but, um, in the landscaping, we either use, try to use native or edibles. So we have, we have so many blueberry bushes around that they're that they're they're actually getting they're not they don't have enough space. So we're trying to figure out how to kind of find them space and move things around a bit. But, and and yes, I th what we tried to do actually these three the other well the Florida project well we had a few pea patches and things, but the Suzuki our first proposal was to actually have a an acre and a half of open space for growing and actually really treat it as a farm. Um, and, the, and the project in Manson is an agri-hood. The, the perimeter of the project is going to have grapes growing on it. It used to be an orchard. Um, and then in on the interior, there'll be more n edible landscaping as, as well as food beds. So I think that's, and that, uh, that goes back to kind of reducing the, imp the carbon footprint from transportation and food, which is three times what we have for our homes. So it's we, uh, keeping everything local is, is growing as, in as many places as possible is essential. So. It's also a, a really great way to create community. One of the things we're finding at GROW is that the pea patches are located in the middle of clusters of seven homes. Mm -hmm. So when you walk out your front door, you're walking through those gardens, and it's a great way for people to connect. It's actually uh, works a little too well sometimes. It's hard to hard to run errands quickly in that neighborhood. So it's, it's really interesting to see how little things like that have huge impacts in so many different ways. It's encouraging people to grow their own local organic food and also engaging people and connecting with each other. Yeah, um, so I'm just curious, what is it that allows Suzuki to be green um, and affordable? Um, the affordability piece is, you, it has to be paid for, and, and, and as does, as does any increase that might be seen for sustainability, um, which, in, and, and in some cases it's, does, doesn't cost any more, or it has, you know, has the returns that it makes sense, but any, affordable housing project that is, is a, at least of the size of Suzuki it, it needs some sort of infusion of cash, whether it's a tax credit system or donation or the, I mean, the land at Suzuki, if the city puts that in, that really helps, just as it did at Ferncliff. S to be able to achieve that, we're, we're looking, we're gonna, it's the, to make it affordable, you have to put extra money in that doesn't have a return. So that's how it happens, it's not, at, at a project like the Walk, where we have 10% of the, f of the units there are affordable, um, five out of 42 units, that is completely balanced by, you know, the, by the development team. There's no, there's no extra money going in for that because of how the business plan works, which Mari puts together, which includes the solar and everything we do. That's 10% of the housing is being provided by the developer with no extra benefit. So, um, do you want? Yeah, and we're finding from that, we're f beginning to find that we can model homes that are both sustainable and healthy, high quality and comfortable. And um, in projects of 50 homes or more, we can um, possibly get up to 20% affordable housing subsidized by the market rate housing there. So we're looking to do that more and more because um, the federal subsidies, the tax credit programs, all of these things that have supported affordable housing are very, very difficult to access and becoming more and more difficult as uh, that federal funding <laughs> dries up. So we're looking for more market rate solutions and also trying to make sure that we're building quality housing. So a lot of affordable housing is just not good places to live because it's built cheaply and badly and they're very unhealthy places for people to be. So we're trying to incorporate all of these things. It's not easy. Um, and it certainly takes a community to figure out how to do it. Yeah, thank you. I think this is a great example of, of what we can do and is happening here on Bainbridge Island. Just to um, 
tell you what's coming up into the future uh, on the next one of these is going to be climate change and faith communities. And it's going to be on a Wednesday because um, the third Saturday of the month was too close to the holidays and nobody had come. So uh, it's going to be on the Wednesday night, December 5th, and it's going to be here. And we're going to have different faith community leaders um, come and talk about climate change. So there's a flyer out there to do that. The second, we have a series called Movies That Matter. The next one is December 6th. And Tony will be back with Diane. And the name of the movie is called Wasted. It's the story, it's not, you know, some, it's Wasted, the story of food waste. And it talks about um, Anthony Bourdain, Bourdain, remember him, the guy just died? He uh, produced it. And it's talking about food waste and how that contributes to climate change. Uh, last thing is we get this space donated by Eagle Harbor Congregational Church, but they ask for a donation. So on your way out, if you don't mind, if you could put a little money in the donation jar that goes back to the church here for, um, for them. And finally, I want to thank John McKenzie for the videotaping and the whole crew here for, for putting this on. So I hope to see you uh, on December 5th back here and to uh, have the third session for this year. So thanks, everybody, especially for the speakers today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye.